Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Lenten mission for the Catholic community of Bartlesville. It's good to have you here. Uh, we also are doing this online. So if you see that, I forgot to share it with St. James. I better go do that right now. Sometimes we have to do things when we, have, when we remember, right? I'm still Father John, you know, this is, the, this is our reality. But it's good to have you here. You know, last year at this time, we were to have a, a Lenten mission by Father Alar talking about divine mercy. And in that particular mission was supposed to happen about a week and a half after we shut all the churches down and they shut all the travel down. So Father Alar is actually on our calendar not the exact date yet, but as soon as he's able to travel, he has told us that he is going to make us first priority because we were the first one that was canceled of all his talks. So we will have him here. Maybe it will be Advent this year. Maybe it will be Lent this year. I'm almost there. Here we go. I just got to share this with St. James because I said it would be on both. Share to a page. St. James, publish. See how easy that is? Does anybody want to learn that? I just did that. It all works. That's what they all say, right? So this evening is going to be an evening of prayer, of reflection. Uh, you know, in this particular moment, we've invited Deacon Kevin Sartorius to come and talk about forgiveness. And he will be here uh, he's already here, but he will be sharing with us this evening a talk. We will have some time for adoration uh, and prayer and reflection, and then we'll close it out after that. We're going to start with song. So I want to make sure if you haven't picked up a little thing, we got him in the back, we got him over here. Please make sure that you have one of these because it has the words to the songs we're going to sing. Let's begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Good and gracious God, we are thankful for this day, and we're thankful for all days that you give us. In this moment, as we come before you, we want to hear your voice. Guide our hearts, guide our minds, open our eyes and our very beings to your love, and your grace, and your mercy. In this moment, as we gather in the church, as a community of believers, we lay ourselves at your feet and we ask that you fill us this evening. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Sing. 
sing holy, 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 I want to see. It's a blessing for me to be able to introduce our speaker this evening. Deacon Kevin Sartorius is the executive director of Catholic Charities of Eastern Oklahoma. He was my boss for eight years. So uh, say nice things about me. He's not my boss now, but say nice things about me. Um, I learned through, uh, and and I've known Kevin for, what, 18 years, something like that, 20 years, there isn't nothing I wouldn't do for Deacon Kevin. 
In fact, there is nothing that Deacon Kevin wouldn't do for me. So for years, we've been going around doing nothing for each other. So. <laughs> but uh, Deacon Kevin is, is coming to share in a topic that, especially when we're talking about Lent and the mercy of God, the grace of God, forgiveness. And I'm so glad you're here, Deacon Kevin. So welcome and thank you for being here. Well, they say turnabout's fair play, right? So now Father John is my boss uh, because he's a board member of Catholic Charities. And so now I report to him along with, uh, with, along with Mark Haskell back there. He's on our board. And, um, and uh, Bishop Condola and many other uh, people who guide our organization. Um, I want to say uh, a, a special thanks to uh, our fathers, the deacons that are here. Um, and all of you for coming out. Uh, it's a great turnout, a really fantastic turnout. And I'm looking here online, there are 28 people online, including, hold on, let me see here, Jean Osborne. I don't know if you all know Jean Osborne, but she's tuning in from Florida. So we have a, a, a nationwide audience. It's like, uh, what was it, Bishop Sheen, right? Is that right? Um, almost, almost. Um, it's good to be here. It really is. Um, and I'm here to talk with you tonight, as it says, about, about forgiveness. It's a, a great topic uh, because it, there's really uh, nothing that will bring more joy uh, than forgiveness, uh, even if it makes us nervous uh, to, to talk about it, I think. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to dive into a, a, a story, an analogy, a pericope. There's a lot of words you could use for it. And we're just going to kind of talk our way, our way through it here. Um, and so I, I titled this one, Live in the Dream. Um, I don't know how many of you all have been down to Oklahoma City in the last couple of months, but boy, they repaved a piece of the Turner Turnpike, and it's awesome. I mean, you just put the cruise control on, you lean back, and it just drives itself. Now, I asked Father John, and he said, well, maybe downtown Bartlesville, because they've redone all the roads in downtown Bartlesville. That might be something similar. Nice, smooth perfect, you know, blacktop that just is so fun to drive on. I'm kind of a car enthusiast. Uh, when you see that, uh, you're excited about it, or at least I'm excited about it. But you know, one thing that you know that's going to happen uh, when uh, you drive on roads is uh, that they're going to be impacted by rain and sleet and snow, right? Oh my. We saw it last week or two weeks ago. Can you believe how warm it is today? in comparison with where it was, like negative 12 or something like that at night, uh, and snow on the ground, which we don't always see in Oklahoma. Um, in some ways, it's a beautiful sight to see, but if you're a guy who does construction or maintenance on roads, if you work for Oklahoma Department of Transportation, you just kind of shake your head because it doesn't, there's nothing good that comes from rain, sleet, and snow on, on asphalt. It, uh, it really can be uh, damaging. And so what you end up having to do is pour money into maintenance. Uh, you get out there quick, if you're lucky, right? And you start putting tar on those little cracks. Because if you don't put tar on the little crack in a road, water gets in there, water freezes, the crack gets bigger. And we've probably all driven on roads around town uh, here lately where we would say, yep, yeah, it's already happened, you know, here in Bartlesville because of the recent um, uh, ice and sleet that we've experienced. Well, if you don't get on it quick, then you've got to put the little patch on the road, throwing the, the, the asphalt down, trying to cover it up. And in, in my part of the state, uh, in east of Tulsa by Inola, the way they generally do that is they have some guy, I don't know how you apply for this job, but he gets a scoop off the back of the truck, he runs out in the middle of, of traffic uh, when people are going 50 miles an hour, and he slaps it down on the ground close to the hole, right? Because, I mean, he's got to move, and he gets out of the way so that you can run over it and pack it down, yeah? And that's Oklahoma uh, highway maintenance uh, for the most part. <laughs> Um, and I see it year after year, and I just think, like, man, those guys deserve, like, I want to pull over someday and say thank you for risking your life so that I can get home without a bump in the road. Uh, it's amazing to watch uh, highway maintenance. But, you know, the, the, the alternative to that little uh, squiggle of tar that we use to cover up a road uh, where there's a crack or that little uh, black patch that they throw out there on the highway is, is degradation, 
the highway starts to fall apart, the road, the street starts to fall apart, it becomes disrepaired, uh, it can become a disaster. A big, huge pothole that swallows up a Volkswagen and, you know, the pictures on, you know, the front page of the examiner the next day and everybody's saying, like, wow, I'm glad that wasn't me. Um, or um, the, the road that you just can't hardly drive on without tearing your wheels off because it's got so many little potholes in it. That's our alternative to maintenance. Uh, and that's really inconvenient, right? That's really a shame. Uh, but it's also not as bad as it can get. Uh, that degradation and disrepair can turn into major damage and even rupture. And uh, certainly we've all seen, maybe if the, the streets got redone in downtown, it may have been that they were digging them all the way out and even putting new pipes underneath them. And uh, really spending a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of businesses maybe uh, were unreachable because they had a, a big project on their hands. Um, or it could be, as, as I've seen, I live out in, you know, in the country, there's no, uh, it's a one stop light town, I know Oklahoma, and uh, between me and, and uh, the gas station there's a bridge. Well, the bridge went out because of the 2019 rains, and for about a year we didn't drive a straight line to Inola, we drove up and over and back uh, to get to town. And so um, that's, uh, that's a rupture. That's really a damage And you, when you've got to reroute everything and go out of your way. The bridge was burned, if you will. Uh, the bridge fell. Uh, it's just not how things are supposed to be. You know, we were kind of given the promise early on of, of Farfignugan. Do you remember that phrase, Farfignugan? Uh, that's the Volkswagen phrase of uh, driving enjoyment. That's a German word that means driving enjoyment. Now, I didn't put a Volkswagen up on the screen. For those of you who can see it, I put a Tesla up there because there was a lot of conversation about us getting the big Tesla factory. Uh, but driving enjoyment, that's what we were kind of promised. And that's what we aim for, and that's what we enjoy, and that's what we're really, really excited about. And so if we're looking for that, what, what I'd like to do is maybe almost start over and go back to the beginning and put it in a different context and say, when we're looking at this awesome patch of road that you can just cruise down that American dream in the 67 Mustang and you're just enjoying it and all the rest, that was how God planned it for us. That's how it was designed, that we would be in perfect harmony, that all things would be wonderful, that we would uh, live in communion with him and in communion with each other, that we would somehow uh, get along. No, love each other, that we would love each other, um, that we would uh, lay down our lives for each other uh, because we love each other so much. There is nothing I wouldn't do for Father John, and I do nothing for him all the time, right? That's how he said it. We didn't plan that. Uh, that's just how it came out, right? Uh, there isn't nothing I would do, right? And that's, that's how it should be for my spouse, for my children, for my parents, uh, for my siblings, uh, for people I don't know, for people I've never met on the other side of the planet. That's how we were designed by God, to be in his image and likeness, to truly be in love with each other. But somehow, we end up with rain, sleet, and snow. Uh, the fall took place, um, we're damaged, uh, we're prone to sin, uh, we disagree with each other, uh, we have challenges. Uh, we have challenges with our siblings or our, our children, our, our spouse. We have challenges uh, with people on the other side of the planet we've never even met. But somehow, you know, the news can get us all riled up to the point where we don't even like those people in that other state or that other country. Um, it's all division. It's all tension. It creates uh, frustration. And that's the rain and the sleet and the snow of our situation here. Well, uh, we've got to get in there and move on it fast, right? Whenever that happens. Don't let the, sense, the sun set, you know, on your disagreement. Don't let the sun set. Get out there and put tar on it. Fix it. Uh, put a little bit of uh, asphalt in that uh, pothole, even if you've got to run out in traffic to do it, right? Even put yourself at a little bit of risk to get out there and make that repair. Because if you don't, it ends up with degradation, and disrepair and disaster. The relationship starts to get kind of atrophied. It gets cold. It gets uncomfortable. 
it gets ugly. It gets mean and nasty. Lawyers get involved. Oh, man, lawyers. Ugh. You know? Sorry if there's any lawyers in the room. Uh, but lawyers get involved. It can become really, really stressful. And it's not what we planned. It's not what we were thinking of in the garden, to have lawyers involved or to have that kind of disagreement and disrepair. Well, at its worst, it's major damage and rupture. Um, uh, so I didn't plan this, but it just was given to me by God. I sat at MCI. I used my, my gig before this was I worked as an IT guy at MCI uh, at a big, huge building. In this building, you could stand up and you could see like 500 cubicles. And when you sat down, you were all isolated, right? We're in Cubeville, they call it. Well, on, right on the other side of the wall of my cubicle is another person, another, another human being. She was in a different department from me, so I didn't really know anything about her. Uh, but I would hear her get off the phone at this, at this moment in time, frustrated, and then angry, and then sad, and then crying, and talking with her kids, arguing with her spouse, and then talking with lawyers, and getting divorced. And I sat on the other side of this cubicle. Like the cubicle wall is probably like right here, right? And she's that far from the cubicle wall on the other side. But when I got up to go get a drink or go to lunch or something, I'm supposed to just kind of, you know, not really acknowledge that I can hear every word that she's saying on those phone calls. But I could see the damage that was being done, the major damage, the rupture that was happening in her family and how sad it made her. And it just, it really hurt. It hurt her so bad. It hurt her children. It hurt me, even though I didn't even really know what her name was, uh, to witness that kind of difficulty in, in their relationship. But we're trained, aren't we? We're trained to not get involved. You know, I'm not supposed to go over there and say, hey, I can hear all your conversations. Could I talk to you about it? You know, this is a Fortune 50 company. You're supposed to stick to business, stick to PowerPoint, right? We stick to PowerPoint and stay on script and don't worry about those things. Well, it just, it just it ate her alive. It was so hard uh, to hear that. But major damage happens every day. We see it. It's so easy to spot in others, right? It's so easy to spot that major damage in others. It's hard sometimes for us to see it in ourselves, uh, but we know it's there too. Uh, because we're all fallen. And so this isn't the way we were called to live, or it's not what was uh, planned for, but somehow it, it is oftentimes what happens. Uh, what we were planned for is this thing that I'll call farfagnugan, you know, driving enjoyment. We were called to have good, holy relationships where we lift up our brothers and sisters in Christ. Whether they're Christians or not, whether we agree with them or not, uh, whether we uh, live on the same side of, of the planet or not. And so when we get sideways with people, we have to step back. And it happens, it happens probably every day that we, we get a little sideways with people. We have to step back and look at it in God's eyes, through God's eyes. What, what does he think of that person? How does he want me to react to that? You don't have to disagree with everything. But you'd, you do have to, I think, understand what God's plan is in that situation. Uh, we all go to Chinese restaurants probably and open the little fortune cookie and it has some kind of cute saying in it. I don't know why they don't put proverbs in fortune cookies because they're like the true deal, man. They're the real thing. Um, this, this first uh, verse is, says, love prospers. Love prospers when a fault is forgiven. I have many faults. But love will prosper if you'll forgive me. In fact, if I say anything wrong tonight, please forgive me, right? And, and if you do, then I think we'll, be, we'll all be uh, better off because of it, yeah? Love prospers when a fault is forgiven. But dwelling on it separates close friends. How many close friends have been separated because of a fault, because of a disagreement? And how unfortunate is that? People that we don't want to be around anymore, we don't want to talk to, 
uh, because we don't think exactly the same. Or they didn't call me when they should have. Or they did call me when they shouldn't have. Or whatever it is, the list goes on and on and on, right? Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Isn't it amazing how often I'm the guy who gets into trouble and God forgives me and then I walk out and I choke the neck of the other guy who owes me like 10 cents, right? Who, who I say, hey, you know, you didn't, you, you were supposed to, you know, you're with the Knights of Columbus and I'm with the Knights of Columbus. You said you were going to get the beer for the horseshoe tournament and you didn't. Well, like, who cares? But I mean, are we going to like get into that kind of argument? Why do we live in that space where we argue with each other about completely nonsensical things? Christ Jesus forgave us. What a joy. How could we ever outdo that? And if that pours into us, if that forgiveness that he gave us from the cross pours into us, how could it not but overflow into the world, forgiving others uh, when they maybe slight us or when it's just a misunderstanding or when it's something really serious, right? It could be something really serious. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. That's so powerful. When we give each other permission to fail, we don't glory in that. We don't like look forward to it and say, hey, you know, go get drunk. It's no big deal to me. That's not what I'm saying. But when we know that someone else is broken and we, we will not condemn them, I'm here with you, brother. I'm going to walk with you. I love you. And then, and then you fall down, and they say, let me help you up. You know, let me help you up, because we're in this together, right? It creates solidarity in a life that's oriented towards a life of holiness, as opposed to, ha, you fell down? Watch this. We can kick him now, right? Let's go kick him, because he's fallen down. And so much of our society is oriented around kicking somebody when they're down as opposed to saying, you know, buddy, I love you. Don't worry about that. I've got you. Let's get up and let's do this together. Um, I'm going to accompany you, as Pope Francis would say, because we're on a journey. We're on a journey together. It's a whole different mindset, a whole different orientation. It's not a, um, a kill or be killed or um, eat them you know, eat them alive, uh, win, win. It's not about winning, unless we're winning together, unless we're making that journey together. Uh, just a, another, one more set of these. Uh, blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. When we forgive someone, or when we're forgiven, there's a blessing in that. You know, Father at the end of, uh, well, it'll be Deacon, Jerry at the end here will give us a benediction of the Blessed Sacrament. He will bless us with Jesus. When we forgive, we give a blessing to another person. In your baptism, you're called to be a priest, a prophet, and a king. You exercise your priesthood by blessing other people. Not just when they sneeze. Oh, God bless you. Well, that's great. I love it. Do that. But do it even more powerfully by forgiving someone's transgressions. Because that will truly be a blessing to them. For the judgment is merciless to one who has not shown mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. A little bit of foreboding in that one from James. Yeah? A little foreboding. We are called to give mercy, to forgive. Because if we don't, we reap what we sow all too often. And I think, you know, let's, you know, not go into politics, but let's think of the political sphere where there's just no mercy. It's all judgment. And one side judges the other, and the other side judges back, and judges, 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 until there's nothing left. Just what, hell? Yes. Father Daigle says it's just hell, right? 
uh, it is. And so we can't get caught up in that trap. We're Christians. We live a different life than that. We live a life where mercy triumphs over justice. And justice is giving somebody what is due to them, yes? Justice is a virtue. It's giving to somebody what is due to them. Well, what is due to this person? They should pay a fine. They should be kicked out of the club. I shouldn't talk to them anymore. You're not my son anymore. You're dead. That kind of stuff happens in this country, in this world, in this community right here. That can't happen with Christians. We have to say, you know what, I love you. I don't necessarily agree with this. I don't, I don't like what just happened. But you're not going to shake me. Uh, we're in it to the end. Um, because I'm your brother. Uh, whether he's your brother or your coworker, he's your brother, right? That's who we are. The most, some of the most powerful moments of this are just mind-blowing. If, if we look at, and I'm sure you probably all know the story, but if you look at the story of, of Maria Goretti, right? And the forgiveness she gave and the result that came from it. Maria Goretti is a young woman. Uh, her father's died. Her family is living with another family in Italy. Uh, she goes out and works the field and so forth. Well, one of the young men of this, this family had uh, evil intent. He had a bad desire. Uh, he wanted to rape uh, Maria Goretti. Uh, what a terrible thing. And she resisted. She said, I would rather die. I'd rather die. And so he obliged her. You know, he killed her. Uh, he stabbed her to death. But before she died, she forgave him. And uh, that is an unbelievable mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. There should have been judgment there. Uh, you're going to go to hell for this. That's a grave sin. You separate yourself from, from the church. You separate yourself from God by doing this. I damn you to hell. That's not what Maria said. She said, I forgive you. And so he went to jail. There was a corporal punishment for his, a bodily punishment. He was separated from society and put in jail for like 27 years or something like that. Um, and in that time, he had to wrestle with the fact that she forgave him. And he had to come to terms with what he'd done. When he got released, he went out and asked her mother, if she could forgive him. And they went to communion together that day. She took him to the church. She didn't take him to the woodshed. And they celebrated his brother and sister. When Maria Goretti was beatified, when they, like uh, Blessed Stanley Rother, when they had uh, the beatification of Maria Goretti, Maria Goretti's mother was sitting there at the Vatican next to uh, Alessandro Serenelli, the man who killed her. How often would you be at a beatification mass where you've got the mom and the murderer sitting next to each other to see this happen? Judgment is merciless to the one who has not shown mercy, but mercy triumphs over judgment. Can you imagine how radiant Maria Goretti must be in heaven? How beautiful it must be? Maria's mother said, I've lost... Now, this is, a, uh, this, is, this is what's often written. Maria's mother said when she lost her daughter, I have lost a daughter, but I've gained a son. I'll, I'll bring that, that murderer into my own family. I'll make him mine to help fill the loss of my daughter. And I'll love him. I won't judge him. I won't condemn him. I won't fight with him. That is so powerful. Uh, it's, it's so awesome. 
And I see it happen in so many different ways, even, even now. If you were to come on a, a retreat at Catholic Charities that we have called Rachel's Vineyard, uh, it's women uh, mostly, but also men. There's typically men there as well uh, who have uh, experienced abortion. It may be the dad who said, you're not going to be pregnant in my house. I'll drive you there and I'll pay for it. It may be the woman who uh, chose that. Um, it may be the woman who was forced to have an abortion by her boyfriend or by her parent or by somebody else. It could be an aunt who drove or paid for it. Oftentimes, these people are there because they can't forgive themselves. And they place judgment on themselves. There's no way I could ever go to communion again. I killed my grandchild. Can you imagine the trauma, the difficulty of that, and how much they need to forgive themselves and to call out to God for mercy? Can you imagine the tears of joy that happen by the end of that retreat when they know how much God loves them? And how we don't condemn them, we don't judge them, we offer mercy to them as a church. We offer mercy as a church and as a people. They say in uh, accounting or in investments or whatever that past performance does not um, guarantee future results, right? Past performance does not guarantee future results. You may go out and buy game stock and it may be on the rise, but it may also come back down, right? Uh, we've seen that in the headlines here lately. Well, past performance in life does not guarantee future results. Just because I've done something wrong, uh, just because I've committed a grave sin, or even have a habitual problem, doesn't mean I can't go to the priest and ask for forgiveness, to go to God and ask for forgiveness, and that he won't give it. He offers it freely. And once that's happened, all debts are paid. And so just because that happened many years ago does not mean I'm condemned in the future. The future result is heavenly bliss when we just come and say, Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And he says, forgive them, Father, for they don't know what they're doing, right? And I die for their sins. And I love you. Please come. Come to the master's table. Sit at the front. Alessandro Serenelli died in like 1970. I would imagine he's in heaven, even though he killed somebody. And I would imagine he's probably sitting uh, with Maria uh, in a, a heavenly embrace, a beautiful, holy embrace. How crazy is that? That's what God offers us. Well, it's a lot of interesting conversation, but when you get down to the brass tacks of it, like how do I, like let's say, uh, let's say we're building, let me give you a hypothetical. Let's say we're building a, a big Catholic Charities building and we're building a medical clinic as a part of that and the nun from St. Francis says, I want it this way and then you pay for it with the construction company and then she says, no, 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 I don't want it that way. I want it this way instead. And it costs more money to fix it and change it that way. And then they say, well, I don't think we want doors after all. And you say, you know, I'm smacking my forehead. And it, I get to a point, hypothetically, where I cuss out a nun. Let's just say something like that could happen, right? Um, not a good situation. Uh, I got out of that hypothetical meeting and I called then uh, Bishop Slattery and I said, Bishop, you might hear from Sister because I may have said some things in, in a little bit of anger and uh, let's just see where it goes, right? Well, um, not a good situation. I was very angry with, with the costs and the changes and the nonsense. And I felt that I was justified. Justice said, you're not doing this right and you need to quit doing it that way. The way I behaved was pretty poor. <laughs> and so uh, I had the opportunity then to uh, choose the next step, right? I'm never gonna be in the same room with that lady ever again, you know? 
I don't have to see her eye to eye. I don't even like her, you know, she, you know X, Y, and Z, whatever it is. Um, or um, I can go out there and, and, and build a case that I was right and she was wrong. And I'll win. And she'll lose. Right? I can do that. Or I can simply say, sister, I, I messed up. I don't agree with, with the changes that you keep making. But I wasn't my best self. And I'm sorry for the way I acted. Um, there's been research studies on that, that moment. Because as you can imagine, with the fall, it happens pretty often that people need to forgive each other and they need to ask for forgiveness. And so uh, there was a research study that studied hundreds and hundreds of people who had, um, who watched, if you will, mistakes made and then watched uh, forgiveness be offered or asked for and, and given. And they were told, what do you see? What do you like? What could be done better? You know, it's kind of like pick, pick this apart, this, this uh, offer or this asking of forgiveness. And what they did was they, they started to come out in their research by saying there's more than just saying I'm sorry uh, to asking for forgiveness. Especially if it's, well, I'm sorry. You know, it's like, well, you're really not sorry, right? You're just saying that so that you can get past the moment. But there's no sincerity. There's no integrity in that right? Um, what they found was that there's this kind of like this hierarchy. You can see up here on the screen, and, and for our friends that are on online, uh, I'll read them off. There's uh, a lot to be said about taking an acknowledgement of responsibility. I said things I shouldn't have said. Um, I went overboard. I lost control of my mouth and my temper. Now, every, again, I'll go back to the attorneys. They'll say, never do that. Don't ever acknowledge responsibility because then there's liability that comes with responsibility. Well, blessed be God, Andre Serenelli went to jail for 27 years, and he'll be in heaven for 10,000, and by the time 10,000 years has passed, it's bright shining as the sun. What do we say? We'll have to sing that one at some point. Uh, there's no less days to sing God's praise after 10,000 years uh, in heaven. So to acknowledge responsibility means to kind of clear the air on that. And then an offer of repair came next. So people wanted you to say, one, in that study, wanted you to say, I own it. It was me. And I, I lost my temper. And I'll fix it. I'll, I'll give you, you know, I'll, I'll give you some kind of recompense, if you will. And then I, I shouldn't have done it, an expression of regret. And then an explanation of what went wrong. It, it's very frustrating to me when we change and change and change and it drives up the cost. And that's why I got frustrated. I'm under a lot of pressure to meet budget on this project. And every time we make a change, it doesn't cost the, the price of the outlet. It costs that times three because it's a change order. Uh, but I know that the way I acted was wrong. And I, I, I won't do it again. I've, I've learned a lesson. I'm going to try and do better. Will you forgive me? Uh, that's a very different exchange or opportunity uh, to flesh out forgiveness than just saying, well, I'm sorry, uh, which is pretty lame, honestly, right? I can do better than that. And so here's a, yeah, just another example. Um, if I were to, say, uh, miss an opportunity, a promised uh, opportunity to go out with my boys, I have, I have seven kids, I've got three boys that are teenagers right now, and they like a lot of dad time. Uh, well, if I say, hey, we're going to go to the game next Tuesday, and then I can't go to the game next Tuesday, I, I've, I've, I've breached. It's a little tiny breach. But even, that's just put, we just need to put a little bit of tar on that breach, right? Otherwise, it'll freeze and thaw, and it'll get bigger and bigger and bigger. And I shouldn't let that happen with, with my son or with my wife or with my coworker. You know, I have to work late and I can't go to the ball game that I promised to take you to. But let's set a time right now for you and I to make it up. And we'll go to dinner beforehand at your favorite restaurant. So I acknowledged responsibility and I offered to repair it. Those are the two most important things. I regret that this has happened. My coworker Jim was scheduled to be at a meeting in Wichita, but now he's sick. So I have to go up there and replace him. 
it's an explanation. I didn't just bail on you because I think you're a jerk or because I know I can run over you. I, 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 I broke my word because I really need to fill in for somebody else and help them. I'll try to change things at the office so we have more people who can sub in when something like this happens. I'm going to uh, kind of try and build a structure where it won't happen again, a uh, declaration of repentance. Will you please forgive me? It's going to be pretty hard, I think, at that point uh, for Joe or John or Peter not to say, you know, Dad, let's, let's go to the game next week. And, hey, I like this pizza place, you know, uh, because we're, we're on the right track at, at that moment. And it's a whole, it's a whole different time. But uh, it's also, it's not easy to do this. That's a small example. What I've tried to do, um, what I've been taught, if you will, by my spiritual director, um, is that I should take uh, penitential times in the church's calendar and offer forgiveness. As the executive director of Catholic Charities, as a husband of almost 30 years, as a um, a parent of seven, there's plenty of, of mistakes that I've made. I have made a long list of mistakes. And so in Advent, in Lent, what I do is I, I kind of start at the beginning of Lent and I say, hmm, I wh wonder what the, what's the list? You know, who, who, who do I need to, to patch some tar with? Uh, what potholes do I need to fill in? Um, I should be doing it every day, all day, every day. In fact, one other side note, I went down to a place in Florida called Chinocolo, and I spent a couple of days with these guys. It's a home for people who are uh, recovering drug addicts. And they spend three years living in community. The first year, they're just trying to figure out like which end is up. The second year, they're kind of going like, hey, I think I got this. The third year, they're leading the other two years. Um, one of their policies down there was give, for, uh, uh, apologize often, apologize often and for the littlest of things. And so you're sitting there like with them and they're like washing the dishes and dunk, the guy drops the fork. Oh, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? I'm going like, dude, that's a little over the top. You dropped a fork. Uh, but that's it. they're trained. They get into their habit to say, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? And so it becomes easier so that when bigger mistakes are made, we've got practice in doing it. And then all of a sudden, um, you know, they don't do something that's bigger and they say, you know, I, I really am sorry, will you forgive me? Maybe they're shortening this a little bit, but you go like, wow, I, that's something I want to take home. That's something I need to learn to do with my wife and with my kids and with my coworkers, to just acknowledge, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? So, so Friday, I'm having pizza with Father John O'Neill at my house. We're talking about coming here uh, next Tuesday, and uh, I had no idea that I was scheduled to lead Stations of the Cross at Holy Family Cathedral. Just didn't even have it on my radar. So Sunday rolls around and people are like, oh my gosh, you're not dead. You know, we're so happy, you know, but you didn't show up for Stations. Uh, what's the first thing out of my mouth? Well, you didn't tell me. I didn't have it on my calendar. How am I supposed to show up to something when you haven't even told me, right? Justification. Uh, what, what, no, it, the first thing I need to say is, e, I, I am sorry. I'm sorry that I didn't do that. Will you forgive me? It doesn't matter whose fault it was. Uh, it doesn't matter whether I can page through my phone and say you didn't call. Uh, let's, just, let's just ask for forgiveness and let it, let it be done. And it was a much better Sunday because of it. And they figured out, uh, we actually probably have a new deacon candidate out of the deal because Eric Grayless uh, led Stations of the Cross. He's the assistant district attorney for Tulsa County, and he jumped up there and did it. And so now I get to call him and say, hey, I'm sending you the paperwork for the deacon training program, you know? Um, so grace abounds. Where sin uh, is, grace abounds all the more. And uh, we can make a, a great deal out of it. But down, down at uh, Chinoclo, they have a, a great uh, experience of learning how to say, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? For little things. And then it becomes easier with big things. So when the big things come around, it's Lent or it's, it's Advent. I'm sitting there. I'm thinking about, well, gosh, who, who do I need to probably write a letter to? And so I'll just share with you uh, just briefly that um, I have both parents alive. They live in Broken Arrow. Uh, I have th uh, two other brothers, uh, one in Dallas and one in Norman. 
And uh, so I'm the local son. My older brother calls me. He's the oldest son. And so he has authority, right? Or thinks he does, yeah? Um, and uh, he says, COVID is hit. We've got to treat mom and dad like they're on the moon. We're going to talk to them through video calls. We're going to really, really press hard to communicate with them and really be present to them. But they're on the moon. We're not going to see them. We won't be physically present to them because we could kill them, you know, with COVID. And I'm like, well, gee, I mean, Chris, I love that. Except I'm the, I'm the repair guy. I'm the guy who gets the Christmas tree out of the attic. I'm the guy that takes them to doctor's appointments. So I, I need to go over there because they could die in the attic, you know, coming down faster than the Christmas tree, right? Uh, no, 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 no. I'm the oldest. You're going to do it this way. We're not going to have any physical contact. I will not sit at a funeral uh, for my mom or dad because you went and got a Christmas tree out of the attic. Oh, Chris, you know what? I've got something for you, you know? And so all of a sudden, here we have a hard conversation, right? I, I'm a human being, just like everyone else. I make mistakes. I said things I probably shouldn't have said, or at least in the way I said it. And then I went and helped him get their Christmas tree out of the attic. <laughs> uh, well, thinking back on that, I need to write my brother. Uh, and the way I did it with sister, uh, remember that one? Uh, the way I do, do it, we'll do it with my brother is I'll write a letter uh, that that sister could pass around to the president of the hospital or send a bishop or show, post it on, the, on, on social media if they want to. Um, I'm going to humble myself and ask for forgiveness because my relationship with my brother is important. Uh, he is my brother in Christ. Um, soon my parents will be gone and I'll have my brother and, and my little brother as, as our core family. I don't want to have to be in a place where I get on the phone with my little brother and say, well, if Chris is going to be there, I'm not showing up, right? And that happens. Yeah, that happens. Why does that need to happen? I just need to be willing to say, you know, I said things in a way that I shouldn't have, Chris. Um, when we get together, um, you know, I'll, I'll bring a, a great bottle of whiskey and let's just, you know, talk about things that, that we need to catch up on. And let's let this be, be done with. Uh, as far as the east is from the west, yeah? Uh, that is something that as Christians, we can show incredible leadership and uh, really provide grace and abundance on this world. A world that expects us to find winners and losers or beat people up or kick them when they're down. We can say, you know what, this Lent, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find two or three people that I could say I'm sorry to, and I'm going to write that letter. We know what really happens in the end is like with, with say, going back to the one with sister, uh, I sent that letter. Boy, she called me up like 48 hours after I sent it. And I thought, like, man, the post office is fast. That's incredible. Um, and she said, thank you so much. I can't imagine us uh, being at odds. We have so much work to do. There are so many things that we have yet to accomplish. I'm so glad that we don't have to dwell on this. And I tell you, it's like... It's like you're in a helium-filled balloon. You just float uh, because of it. Uh, that, that that rupture isn't there anymore and that you can go on about your business. Is it easy? No, it is so painful to do it. Is it worth it? Absolutely. It's heavenly. So um, I would say that uh, I have many letters that I have yet to write. Uh, and, um, and there are many little ways which I can immediately uh, put a little bit of tar on the road and fix. And when I forgive, I know I'm a better person. And I know that I'm closer to God. And I, I would hope or, or I would expect, I would, I would pray that when you forgive, you'll have a similar experience. And I would encourage you to do that. Uh, and I think as, as we begin adoration, uh, we can contemplate... Um, whether we need to forgive ourselves, uh, whether we need to forgive uh, God because we're angry at him for something, or whether we need to forgive one of our brothers or sisters. Uh, and in doing that um, meditation, um, we need to be open uh, to where it leads us. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we need to receive God's blessing 
that will come through Deacon's hands as he, as he gives the, the benediction. Receive his blessing and go out with that grace and that mercy and uh, change the world in which we live. Uh, may God bless all of you uh, as you uh, journey through Lent as, uh, as beautiful Christians.
sacred silence Holy ocean Gentle water Washing over me Help me listen Holy Spirit Come and speak to me Come and be with me Come and speak to me to me with all your heart don't let fear keep us apart trees do bend though straight and tall so must we to others call long have I waited for your coming home to me and living deeply our new life. The wilderness will lead you to your heart where I will speak integrity justice with tenderness you shall know long have I waited for your coming home to me and living deeply our new life you shall sleep Secure with peace, faithfulness will be your joy. Long have I waited for your coming home to me and living deeply our new life. Long have I waited for your coming home to me. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart, you're the one that guides my Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God. Sin, right?
is found is where you are and where you are Lord I am free holiness is Christ in me is where you So teach my song to rise to you When temptation comes my way And when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay And when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Unto Merco Sacramento, Venere Mucernui, Et Anticum Documentum, Novo Ceda Ritui. Praise that feed a supplementum, sensum de effectui, genitori genitoque, los et lubilatsi o. Salus honor virtus quoque, sit et benedictio, procedenti abutroque, comparsit laudatio. Amen.
praise thy name. Lord of all, we bow before thee. All honor thy scepter claim. All in heaven above adore thee. In infinite thy vast domain, everlasting is thy reign. In infinite thy vast domain, everlasting is thy reign. Please be seated for a moment. First off, I want us to uh, thank Deacon Kevin for coming up and sharing so openly from your heart. We appreciate so much you taking this time. Whenever we have a mission or a day of prayer, something like this, we always take a collection up for the organization that uh, is represented here. Usually it's a priest from some far off place or it's from a, a nun from some place who's coming in. But here it's from Deacon Kevin, who's from our hometown. Catholic Charities Mary Martha Outreach will be where the uh, uh, collection goes to. So we're not gonna pass the basket because of COVID, but we have a basket at each one of our corners back in the back and over here is as you leave this evening, if you would uh, be generous, and if you are making out a check, you can make it out to uh, uh, St. James and we'll get it to them. If it's cash, we'll take cash. There's, there's three zeros in a thousand. <laughs> you know. So, um, but it's, it's a blessing to have you here. This is only one step on our continual journey through Lent. We've had 40 days. We're about 30 days left, something like that. Uh, this uh, tomorrow night, Wednesday evening, every Wednesday during Lent, uh, through the 515 Mass at St. John's, we have a holy hour, and we have confessions during that time. And then on Tuesday the 16th, we'll have a penance service. Uh, it will actually be over at St. John's. Uh, Father Carlos, myself, Father Daigle, uh, Father Higgins, who is here with us tonight, will be hearing confessions that evening. It'll be like we did in Advent, a come and go. So you don't have to be there right at 5.30 when we start. If you get off work at six, you can come after that. Uh, last time, we, uh, it was a, a beautiful uh, time. We will have the Blessed Sacrament exposed, so there will be Holy Hour during that for two hours, 5.30 to 7.30. Friday nights, we have uh, the fish fry that starts at five that the Knights of Columbus does so well for us. And then a Holy Hour from six to seven at St. John's and Stations of the Cross after. If you're joining us online, we also have a link to the Stations of a Cross on the Facebook page and on the, uh, 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 I believe it's on our website too for both St. John's and St. James Parish. And you can enjoy the Stations of the Cross. I recorded them last year in COVID. Uh, it has the songs that you sing and, and it's a beautiful way to spend this Lenten time. I know that was one of the most favorite things I did when I was a kid was go, uh, with my dad and my mom and our siblings all to go to Stations of the Cross. So it's a beautiful tradition to have. I think that's it for tonight. We've already been blessed by God, so I'm not gonna give you a, fl a, a final blessing. But uh, uh, Deacon Kevin, you might be in the back in case anyone has any questions or wants to just visit with you. Again, let's thank him for being here. We appreciate it so much. May God bless you as you continue your journey through Lent.